Voila. Hello, everyone, and we're live. So welcome to this uh, last afternoon or morning or night, wherever you are, but last part of the main 2020 event. So it's a little bit sad because it was a lot of fun, but um, hopefully we still have uh, many very exciting talks for you for the uh, for this last stretch. So uh, we're going to uh, go out with a bang. So um, we're going to start with a, a lecture of uh, Professor Paul Sishek, and I'm really happy that he joined us today. Paul is an associate professor at University of Montreal at the Department of Neuroscience. His initial training is in computer science and artificial intelligence. He received his PhD in computational neuroscience and uh, did two postdoctoral fellowship in which he notably investigated the role of premotor and parietal cortices in response selection, planning and movement execution using single unit recording in monkeys. Now he's a lab director at the University of Montreal and he investigates the cortical and subcortical mechanisms that control our interactions with the world. Uh, and I mean, I have to say that locally, Paul is one of the leader in computational neuroscience in, on campus. And so it's a real treat to have him uh, give us one of uh, our um, educational uh, workshop. So Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, that's very nice of you to say. All right, so share screen. And I want to share the whole screen. There we go. And there's my thing. OK, so you can see my slides? Yeah. OK, great. Yes, um, working great. OK, thanks. All right, anyway, so thanks for inviting me to do this. I'm going to describe um, a, sort of an introduction to models of decision making. Um, which is one of the things I study. Now, there, first of all, there are many different kinds of decisions. Um, I want to emphasize that first. There are perceptual decisions where you try to decide what something is that you're looking at. Economic decisions where you weigh costs and benefits of, of various purchasing choices, for example. Probabilistic decisions where you just take guesses. Emotional decisions where you make big life choices based on subjective factors. Simple physical decisions such as us to go right or left around something. And of course, scientific decisions, such as what kind of decision making should I study? Now, to, in this lecture, I'm just going to talk about the first kind, okay, perceptual decision making, which has been very well studied at a neural, behavioral, and uh, computational level. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of a perceptual decision. I'm going to show you a square of pixels composed of blue and yellow pixels, and your task is to decide, are there more blue ones or yellow ones? And the way this is going to work, if, there's, if you think there's more blue ones, you should slap your desk with your right hand. If, it's more, if there's more yellow, slap your desk with your left, with, with your left hand, OK? So now, ready? Go. All right, it, it was yellow. You should have slapped with your left hand. Now, unfortunately, we're doing this virtually. So I and you can't see all the responses and hear all the timing of the responses. So I'll just try to summarize what's probably going on in the audience, across the audience. We're gonna do a few more, okay? Ready, go. Ready, go. Now that one was really easy, okay? And I'm sure you all responded quite quickly, okay? Ready, go. Ready, go. That one was harder, right? <clears throat> uh, the answer is blue, by the way. That one was harder, so you probably all took a little bit longer to respond. But not only that, the distribution across the group was probably broader. Um, let's do a few more. Ready, go. Ready, go. Ready, go. Ready, go. Ready, go. Ready, go. You're probably catching on to a pattern here. Ready, go. So that's right. The answer is always blue, OK? And I'm guessing that you started catching on to that at some point, and your responses were getting faster. So your response here was actually probably much faster than here. So these are some of the trends that are always seen in these kinds of tasks. When you do these kinds of tasks uh, many times or across a large group. <clears throat> when the choice is easy, the reaction time tends to be short, with a relatively narrow distribution across trials or subjects. When the choice is hard, the reaction times are longer and with a broader distribution. But if a hard choice is made common, then it's again faster and narrower, shorter and narrower. 
Now, the explanation for this type of these phenomena <clears throat> is in the form of the so-called rise to threshold models. The idea here is that there's some threshold and there's some neural activity that's rising. And as soon as it hits that threshold, that's when you make your decision. And the rate of the rise is dependent on the strength of the evidence. So the evidence is strong, you rise quickly and make fast reactions. If the evidence is weaker, it takes you longer to get to that threshold. And because there's noise, um, in essentially uh, variability in this rate rising, uh, you get a broad distribution. Even though the noise is the same, the distribution gets broader because there's more time for the noise to broaden it over time. And then uh, the idea for uh, decisions that are made more common is that the starting point at which you start your accumulation is higher. So now you rise, even though you're rising at the same rate, you, you hit the threshold earlier. And this basic uh, thing can be then quantified. There's a distance that travel from start to threshold, there's a slope, and then there's the time taken to decide. And the relationship is relatively easy. And these can be now compared to different distributions uh, and, and uh, accuracy rates, et cetera. And one of the things that, um, one of the things that uh, uh, explains, a model that explains these phenomena quite well is the so-called drift diffusion model, uh, proposed by Radcliffe many years ago. The idea here is that deliberation involves uh, some kind of neural variable which sort of randomly moves over time uh, to, between thresholds. And when it hits a threshold, then you make that, that choice. And the drift of this uh, uh, neural variable is biased by the sensory information you receive from the world. Um, so again, if the sensory information is strong, the rise is faster. If the sensory information is weak, it takes longer. Uh, you can start at a higher starting point if you think you already know which option is more likely, uh, and then you'll get there earlier. Likewise, furthermore, you can also control uh, your speed accuracy trade-off. If you really want to be fast, you can reduce this threshold to make your decisions more quickly. But then you're subject to making error, more errors because of noise, and so maybe uh, if you want to be accurate, you want to increase the threshold. <clears throat> and so the prediction of this model is that during the deliberation, the brain is essentially integrating the net evidence in favor of one choice over the other or others. This, this can be generalized to multiple variables. <clears throat> now, why should the brain be doing something like this? Um, one reason is it filters out noise. Um, integration filters out those little fluctuations. The other reason is that integration of samples approximates a, an optimal statistical test uh, called the sequential probability ratio test. So the idea here is that suppose you're sequentially taking samples of information from the world uh, as essentially your evidence is a set of samples, E1, E2, E3, up to EN, for example, that come in over time. And you want to make a decision such that your error rate is below some uh, value, let's say uh, 0.05. So you want to be 95% accurate. If that's the case, then what you should do is you should choose A when the probability of A, given the evidence that you've received up till now, divided the probability of B, given the that same evidence that you received up till now, is larger than your desired success rate divided by your acceptable error rate. And you would choose B if the opposite is true, if the evidence for B, uh, the, the probability of B, given the evidence you received, is above this, uh, divided by A, is above this threshold. And if neither of these holds, then you should wait because you're not accurate enough yet. You should wait for more evidence to come in and improve your, your estimate. And this uh, procedure, the sequential probability ratio test, gets you to that threshold with the smallest number of samples. So it's optimal in that way. <clears throat> now, how would you calculate these probabilities? Uh, for some reason, my mouse is freezing. <clears throat> how would you calculate these probabilities? Um, before you receive any evidence, all you have is a prior, the probability of A given the, divided by probability of B. So you probably don't want to take a chance. You probably want to wait for at least one piece of evidence. When that first piece of evidence arrive, arrives, you can update this to the following policy. You choose A if the probability of A given that first piece of evidence divided probability of B given that first piece of evidence is above your criterion. And of course, you choose B if it's the other way around. Otherwise, you wait. Now, how can you calculate this quantity? Um, as you might expect, you use Bayes' rule. Okay, so, um, uh, Anil Seth already presented Bayes' rule, uh, but many of you are familiar, very familiar with this. And it essentially comes from the idea that you can write the quantity probability of X and Y as the probability of X times the probability of Y given X. Alternatively, you can write probability of X and Y as probability of Y 
multiplied by the probability of x given y. And because both of these are equal to the same thing, they're equal to each other, and therefore now you can rearrange the terms and you can get Bayes' rule. The probability of x given y is equal to the probability of y given x times the probability of x divided by the probability of y. So now you can essentially take this quantity and rewrite it like that, simply by substituting the terms. And so now what you get is the following policy. You choose A if this ratio divided by this ratio is larger than your criterion. And now these terms here you can cancel out, so you can simplify it a little bit. And it's just this quantity. This, this is your now uh, decision rule for A. Of course, you get the other one for choosing B. Now, as new evidence comes in, as long as each new piece of independence evidence comes in, you can factor it into this equation. You get this big, uh, this product. Now, this is a little bit awkward. You can make it sim simpler, simpler um, uh, by taking the logarithm. <clears throat> so now you have the logarithm of the priors, probability of A divided by probability of B, plus the sum over all the samples you re received up till now of the log likelihood ratio. The likelihood of seeing that sample that you saw if A is correct, divided by the likelihood of seeing that sample if B is correct. You divide those, take the log, and then these are the things you sum up until you exceed this quantity here. So you can see this is the prior. This is the accumulated evidence in terms of log likelihood ratios. And this is your threshold, which depends on your desired uh, accuracy criteria. So you start a level related to priors, add up evidence until the threshold. It's essentially the drift diffusion model that I presented. This is why the drift diffusion model is a good way of making decisions. <clears throat> now, testing the model can be done in many ways, like the task that I showed you, for example. But one that I want, I'm going to describe is uh, based on the work of Michael Shadlin, uh, where monkeys are trained to perform a random dot motion discrimination task. The idea here is the monkeys have to make a decision that they report with a saccade. Uh, so they start fixating here. They have two targets for res responding. And then they're shown this motion stimulus. And it looks a little bit like this. Uh, it's a very noisy stimulus with a bunch of dots moving. But some small percentage of these dots is moving to the right or to the left. In this case, it's actually to the right. But it's a small percentage. It's a hard task. And then the monkey reports his decision with a saccade. Now, <clears throat> um, Shadlin and others have recorded uh, monkeys doing this task. And they've recorded in many, many different regions of the brain. The motion sensitive area MT, um, the um, uh, sensory area LIP, uh, prefrontal cortex, the frontal eye fields, the superior colliculus, many parts of the oculomotor system. And this is actually interesting. This is a whole other potential lecture that I've described this as a perceptual decision about which way the dots are moving. But in fact, it seems to unfold within sensory motor system. And essentially, the, the idea, the proposal that Shadlin and others have made, Romo has made these proposals as well, is that uh, this decision actually unfolds as a competition between actions. And those, but that competition is biased by the sensory evidence, in this case, the random dot motion. <clears throat> now I'm going to just show you the results from LIP because they're the cleanest and, and, and clearest. What you see, if you record from LIP, is in fact, you see neural activity growing at a, at a rate that depends on the strength of the evidence, the motion strength, essentially, the coherence, the percentage of coherent dots. So if, if, if a lot of dots are moving in one direction, you grow, the activity grows quickly. If just a few, it grows much more slowly. Furthermore, if, if you align the activity on the saccade, it seems to always reach a constant threshold, something like, like the threshold of the diffusion model. If you then uh, alternatively group trials by, by reaction times, you see that the short reaction time trials have a faster rate of growth than the long reaction time trials. So this is a, a, essentially the predictions, supporting the predictions of the drift diffusion models. And there's many, many studies that have supported this model with neural recording in many regions and many tasks, as well as functional imaging, EEG, you name it. Uh, so the drift diffusion model is well supported. It's essentially an integrative evidence to a constant threshold. So you have some noisy evidence that might be strong or weak, and then you integrate it, and then you bring it to a threshold either quickly or slowly. Uh, and you can express it, let's say, with this kind of integrate equation where you start at a prior, integrate until some threshold. <clears throat> and so the diffusion model is now widely accepted as the explanation for decision making during these kinds of perceptual discrimination tasks. It makes good mathematical sense. It's similar to that statistical test. 
It explains behavioral data on accuracy and reaction time distributions quite well. And it explains the widespread observation of buildup of neural activity during a variety of decision-making tasks. <clears throat> now, I could stop here. Um, this kind of pre presents the, the fundamental um, consensus in, in the field. But I'm going to actually um, go in a slightly different direction. And I, and I just want to make a warning here that things beyond this point get controversial. Um, many people, uh, including myself, are, are doubting some of the things that I've said. So I've tried to convince you that this is a good model. Now I'm going to try to convince you to doubt some of its aspects. And it's really based on three questions. The first is, what if the world changes? Second, what information really should be integrated? And third, what is the kind of optimality that we really want? <clears throat> and I'll, I'll start with the first. What if the world changes? Um, in the natural behavior, of course, the world is always changing. Sometimes evidence favors B, and then it favors A, because something really did change. Now, an integrator will always be sluggish in its response to such changes. So if you're integrating towards B, and then the situation changes, now you're going to have to take some time, even just to integrate away the information to B before starting to integrate towards A. It seems, in principle, you should be able to be faster, more, more quickly respond to changes, maybe with some kind of reset mechanism, an increase in gain, or something else. Now, I'll come back to that after I've addressed the other two questions. So question two was, what information really should be integrated? As some of you may have noticed, when I presented this equation, I, I, I made a caveat. This is what you should do if the sequential samples are actually statistically independent uh, and identically distributed. Now, in fact, that's not usually true. If you look at an image, your first glance gives you a lot of information. But the second glance doesn't give you that much more th th that much more information. It gives you some new information. But the third glance, the fourth glance, the fifth glance, et cetera, give you less and less because they're partially redundant with the previous. Now, to take this redundancy into account, we need to ask the, actually extend Bayes' rule to multiple variables. And you can do this to any number of variables. And that will turn this equation into something slightly more complicated, that what you should be accumulating is not just the likelihood of seeing that thing given A, versus given B, but the likelihood of seeing that sample given A and all the previous samples are divided by the likelihood of seeing it given B and all those previous samples. That's the more correct way, more complete way of doing it. So now let's consider two cases. The first case is that sample EK really is completely independent, completely novel. Well, then the probability of EK given X and the previous samples is actually equal to just the probability of EK given X. The, uh, the previous samples don't matter. And so therefore, this reduces back to this equation. And then uh, effectively, it means that if a sample is independent, you should, in fact, sum it, the full log likelihood ratio. But now consider the other extreme case. If sample EK is completely predicted by the previous samples, well, then the probability of EK given X and those previous samples is actually 1, because it's predicted by those previous samples. And so the log of 1 over 1 is just 0. And so this whole term disappears. And so if a sample is redundant, you should completely ignore it. But all the cases in between, what you should actually be doing is something like this, where you um, scale the log likelihood ratio of the sample by a term that's actually related to the mutual information between sample K and the previous samples. So the conclusion is we should only accumulate evidence to the extent that it is not uh, to properly implement the sequential probability ratio test. So now let's consider some mechanisms that might be in, at play. Um, <clears throat> The optimal mechanism is to actually compute it explicitly. So the first you start the priors, then you take the first sample, which is completely novel, so it's just the luck likelihood ratio. Then the second sample is multiplied by this term. The third sample is multiplied by this more complicated term. The fourth sample by a still more complicated term, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is actually not possible to solve, not just because it's complicated equations, but because it's extremely unlikely that you actually have enough experience in the task to know all these joint probability distributions. Um, and so what the, bra the brain can't possibly do this optimal, ideal thing, but it can do some um, approximations. Like for example, one approach is to try to just predict the next sample. And then uh, if there's a difference between your prediction and the actual next sample, then well, then that's novel. At least it's novel to you. And so you should accumulate what you can't predict. 
And the simplest version of this is that you just predict that things don't change. That means anytime a change happens from a previous sample, you consider that interesting and that's what you integrate. Now, not every change, because you might have some assumptions about the frequency of changes that are relevant. And maybe you want to filter out high frequency noise with some kind of low pass filter. And effectively, this, this simple solution is effectively uh, approximated by just a low pass filter, something very simple. So in a noisy task, what would this look like? A novel evidence will first be very strong. The first sample is independent. The second sample gives you some uncorrelated novel evidence. The next one a little less, next one a little less, et cetera, et cetera. So if this was your actual novelty signal and you integrated that novelty signal, it would in fact look a lot like a low pass filter. So a low pass filter is a pretty good approximation of actual um, uh, accumulation of, of novel evidence. And that's essentially the key integration. The accumulation of novelty will look a bit like this uh, kind of low pass filter, uh, whether it's strong or weak. And this would be a leaky integrator. And Usher and McClelland many years ago suggested that perhaps this is a better model, a leaky integrator for uh, making decisions. The problem with this model, though, is how do you get to the threshold? If the threshold is too high, that your evidence is, is, is so weak that you won't, you'll, you'll saturate before you get it, how would you ever make a decision in this condition? Um, <clears throat> before I answer that, I'm going to address the third question. What kind of optimality do we want? If you're doing statistics, then what you want is accuracy, right? The criterion of accuracy is determined by convention in the community. Uh, scientists want to be at least 95% confident, maybe 99% confident. So that's your criterion. The uh, sequential probability ratio test is optimal is that it gets you to that agreed upon criterion in the minimum time. And so if you're trying to do your PhD thesis and your results are not significant, well, you really, Sorry, you really have to go get more data, even if it takes you another year to finish your thesis. You have to, it has to be significant. But that's not the case if you're an animal in the wild. Suppose you're an animal in the wild, you're in some situation, and you're 93% confidence that you know what the right choice is. Well, are you going to wait until it reaches 95% confidence? What if it takes 30 minutes? What if it takes a year? You're not going to wait. Time is running out, opportunities are lost, predators come and eat you. Uh, you, you can't wait forever. What you really want to do is, is optimize reward rate. You want to find a kind of a trade-off between your accuracy and your speed so that, such that your reward rate is actually maximized. <clears throat> now, there's a couple of different ways we can um, think about reward rate. Here's a simple way. Where the reward rate is determined by the probability of achieving a favorable outcome, given the information you have, um, after a, a time t spent at deciding gathering information, planning, etc. And that's multiplied by the subjective utility of that outcome, if you are successful. Uh, and then you subtract from that the cost of trying, which includes whatever muscular costs, but as well as the opportunity cost of the things that you're not doing with your time. Uh, and that's divided by the time taken to decide, the time taken to move, and the delay before you can try again. And if you maximize this, you maximize reward rate. <clears throat> this You can call this time discounted expected value. And it's actually the same form as harvest intake and foraging theory, for those of you who are familiar with that. Now, there's a couple of things about this equation that we can then um, <clears throat> make a note about. And in particular, this term here, the probability of making the right choice after a certain time spent deciding. Um, if for a two-choice task, it'll start at 50, <clears throat> and it'll rise, and it'll probably rise as the more time you take to decide, you're probably increasing your chances of making the right decision. But there's some point at which uh, it's diminishing returns, if only because you can't be better than 100%. So because of that shape of the probability function, we can uh, expect that the reward rate will have a peak. There'll be a point at which it rises, and then after a while, it's not right. The probability is not rising, but time is starting to uh, weigh down the cost. So there's going to be some peak in this function, which is going to happen when the derivative of this is zero and when the second derivative is negative. So now you can use that to calculate the probability at which you should decide. <clears throat> And that turns out to be the following equation. The probability, the best time to decide is when your probability is equal to the slope of the probability times t plus m plus d plus c divided by u. Okay? And this is just, you can, you can convince yourself if you just solve this for when the derivative of this equation is zero and the second derivative is negative. That's the peak. Now, this is the best time to commit. Um, <clears throat> and let me show you a geometric interpretation of this as what this implies for your decision policy. So time zero is going to be here. 
And chance level is here, 50% if we're doing a two choice task. So your probability is gonna rise from this point, it's gonna go up, okay? Now I'm gonna put M plus D over here, and I'm gonna put C divided by U over here. And then I'm gonna draw a tangent line from this point to this function and identify this point here, which will now give me the time spent deciding. Now, why, why do I do this? The reason is this geometric shape actually essentially represents this equation. This part here, this part here is just T plus M plus D multiplied by the slope at this point. And that's this part. And this part here is just C divided by U. So this is essentially the solution to this equation geometrically. Now, this is one trial. You can imagine easier trials. You can imagine harder trials. And to each of these, you can find the point of intersection. Uh, and uh, the tangent point. And that essentially defines an accuracy criterion that notice is dropping over time. Okay, so in other words, you should decide if, if, you're, if you're somewhere in this region, you should keep waiting. But once you cross this line, you should make your decision. Now, <clears throat> notice that this is better than any fixed criterion, okay? Because in very easy trials, with just a little bit of extra time invested, you'll really improve your accuracy. It'll be almost perfect. Whereas in very hard trials, you're not gonna bother wasting all this time to improve your accuracy by this much. Effectively, this gives you the best reward rate. Now, imagine now we increase the cost of the movement. So it's more costly to make the movement. Well, now you're gonna get this accuracy criterion. You should be a little bit more conservative if the cost is higher, obviously. If the time taken, let's say, before you can try again is shorter, well, now it'll give you this solution. This is your accuracy criterion. You should be hastier. You should be more willing to take a guess. And that makes sense. The take home message is that in most conditions, you're going to want an accuracy criterion that decreases over time, which means that if the accuracy criterion is decreasing, you will reach it at some point because it's going to come down to wherever you've equilibrated, even if you've got a low pass filter. <clears throat> now, as you recall, the neural data suggests the threshold is constant. Well, so perhaps the threshold really isn't the accuracy criterion. And, and we and many others have suggested that perhaps there's a, another signal called, we can call it urgency, which just rises over time and gradually pushes the neural activity to that threshold, that fixed threshold, effectively implementing a dropping accuracy criteria. You need less evidence as time is going on. So this is the urgency gating model. The basic proposal is that it's not really an integrator. You start at a prior, then you filter the evidence with some kind of a leaky integrator, a low-pass filter, but you multiply it by some urgency signal. Now, this then addresses that first question that I raised. What if the world changes? <clears throat> well, the advantage of a low-pass filter is that it'll respond to changes quickly because it has a short time constant. And yet, it will still make a decision because the criteria is, is collapsing. And at some point, it's going to be forced to make a choice. So effectively, we have two models. Uh, the drift diffusion model, which suggests they integrate all samples to a constant criterion of accuracy, uh, and this uh, variation where you, you don't integrate, uh, you integrate or you have a leaky integrator or a low-pass filter. And then what pushes you to the threshold is actually more this urgency signal. So they're very similar mechanism, mechan uh, models. They're both rise to threshold models, but they propose essentially different mechanisms that are responsible for that rise. Here, it's mostly the urgency signal that brings you to the threshold. You can conceive of these models in a space of models, a broad space of models, determined by time constant, let's say, for leaky integration or perfect integration, like the drift diffusion model. Um, and the urgency slope, if it's flat, then you have essentially a fixed criterion. If it's positive, if it's pushing you up, it's essentially implementing these collapsing bounds or dropping accuracy criteria. So, and there may be other parameters. The drift diffusion model would be here. The urgency gating model would be here. And other models that have been projected, pr proposed, like the leaky competing accumulator might be here. Uh, Mike Shadlin suggests something like a drift diffusion model with urgency, which might lie here, et cetera. Now you might say, but what about all the data? Uh, there's all, you, you know, they, I said early that there's all this data that su supports the drift diffusion model. Well, most of those experiments used constant evidence tasks. So for example, the random dot disc discrimination task, the actual signal that you're making a decision about is not changing over time. It's a, there's a, the underlying signal is constant. So E of A times T is just a constant E of A. If that's the case, then the diffusion model, which you can sort of summarize like this, you can take the constant out of the integral and then this thing here is just time, elapsed time. Likewise, the urgency gating model, you can take the constant out of the filter, 
Uh, and then if the U of T, if the urgency function is just time, elapsed time, then it's the same equation. And so in these conditions, the models will make very similar predictions at the behavioral and neural level. In other words, um, if you do constant evidence tasks, you could uh, fit them with, with models in a very broad range of parameter settings. And for this reason, we and others have been doing these so-called uh, changing evidence tasks where you can uh, estimate what the time constant is more precisely. And in our hands, at least, it favors the urgency gaining model. I'm going to describe very quickly in the last couple of minutes, if I have any, um, uh, what we call the tokens task, which was the project of my former postdoc. So you, you have time, Paul. No, I do? No All right. Rush. Yes, yes. You still right. have f five good minutes. Five good minutes? All right. I'll try to make them worth it. Um, this is a, a project that um, David Thura did in my lab. He now has his own lab in Lyon. Uh, so the task here is to decide between these two targets on the basis of the of decide which one of these two targets is going to receive the majority of these tokens that are jumping randomly every 200 milliseconds. Now, at any moment in time, we can actually calculate what is the probability, let's say, that the right target is correct, given the number of tokens in the right target, left target, and remaining in the center. And it's this complicated equation. The point is, though, that because of this, we can uh, uh, quantify the profile of how that probability changes after every token jump in a particular trial. So this trial is an easy one. The tokens are essentially jumping mostly in one direction, so it's pretty easy to know what is the, going to be the correct choice. Uh, here's a trial that's ambiguous, where the tokens are sort of alternating. You don't really know until the end which one's correct. Here's a misleading trial where the first few tokens actually go in the direction that will turn out to be the incorrect one. So you can classify trials uh, according to this. Now, the other uh, aspect of the task is you don't actually have to wait until the end. If you think you know which one is going, which target is going to be correct, you can make your decision here, prepare your movement, execute your movement, and as soon as you reach the target, uh, you choose that target and reach it, uh, the remaining token jumps accelerate, and you get your reward slightly earlier. And we do this in two blocks. This is the slow block, where this, this um, speed-up factor is relatively minor. But we also do in a separate block of trials where we speed up the tokens much more dramatically in the fast block. And so the idea is you should be relatively con um, uh, conservative in the slow block, but in the fast block, you should be willing to take a lot of early chances because you can really save a lot of time and increase your reward rate. Um, and the proposal is now that you do that by varying your urgency signal. In the fast block, you should have a higher urgency signal than in the slow block and more willing, sort of push yourself closer to that threshold. So now David did a large number of recordings in the brain of brains of monkeys to try to find the neural correlates of the evidence signal and the neural correlates of urgency. And he recorded in dorsal premotor cortex, primary motor cortex, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, as well as in the globus pallidus external and internal segments. These are the output nuclei of the basal ganglia, particularly targeting those that project back into these parts of cortex. Now, I'm not going to uh, show you all the data. Uh, there's quite a few papers on this. I'm just going to show you uh, very recent stuff where we use neural space analysis. Now, I think Sarah Sola is going to say a lot more about neural space analysis. At least, I hope she does, because I want to hear what she has to say about them. Um, so I'm just going to show you what we did with those neural space analyses. So for those of you who may not be familiar with them, the idea here is essentially you compute the neural state in the high dimensional cell space of all the cells you recorded. So it's about 600 cells in David's data. And then you extract the principal components that capture the majority of the variance. So essentially you have some cells, you plot the state of the system in the space of those cells, but then you find a subspace that captures the variance and then you can, you can look at a lower dimensional projection. Um, and this is something that Krishna Shinoi, Byron Yu, and others have uh, pioneered in our field. So this is what we get from the tokens task when we do that. These are the top four principal components that we get. And they're very interesting. Uh, here they're plotted for the different trial types that I described, easy, ambiguous, and misleading. So the first component's interesting because it looks like a state transition. Before, uh, before commitment, it's down here, and then it shifts uh, to movement at movement onset to some kind of other state. So it's sort of telling you when you're transitioning between deciding and acting. The second component uh, is tuned to choosing to the right or to the left. And it looks, in fact, a lot like the evidence that we actually present to the monkey. So this looks like, like the evidence that we present. Um, the third and fourth components together look like um, the, the baseline, the block-dependent shift, as well as the time-dependent rise of the urgency signal. So effectively, 
PCA gives us the four top components that reflect the key elements of the urgency gating model, commitment, evidence, and the baseline and slope of the urgency signal. And we can visualize now how activity uh, evolves over time by plotting trajectories in these components. I'm going to skip component three because it's just flat anyway. I'm just going to plot you the stuff from the slow block. In these uh, three components, commitment, evidence, and urgency, what we find is that if we draw all the points while the monkey's deciding, they form this uh, low-dimensional uh, subspace, uh, a relatively flat manifold in this, in this space. And that manifold is defined sort of by evidence and urgency, as you'll see. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how these different trials evolve over time upon this manifold. And at the same time, I'm also going to rotate it so you can see the structure a little bit. So here we go. So you can see the, the uh, trajectories evolving over time um, on the thing until they reach this edge here. This is at the moment of commitment. The, mo the moment the monkey commits to this decision, they reach these states, this sort of edge. And at that point, then they flow into choice-specific attractors that determine whether it goes right or left. So you see that here, movement onset is about here. So now what we can do is we can characterize the dynamics of the system by looking at this uh, in different groups of cells in the different regions. And I look at the, the shape of this, this so-called decision manifold in those spaces. So in PMD, it looks like this. It's curved as though it lies on the surface of a sphere. Whereas in M1, it's remarkably flat. It's a flat plane. Um, in prefrontal cortex, it's primarily extended along the evidence dimension. And in the globus pallidus external and internal, it's primarily extended on the urgency dimension. So to summarize where this leads us is effectively the following uh, hypothesis. That as Shadlin and others have suggested, the competition between actions biased by sensory evidence. So you have some target information that's engaging this competition in the sensory motor system between different targets. And that's biased by evidence, as well as uh, we would suggest this urgency signal coming from the basal ganglia. Of course, we can model this with circuit models, et cetera, and that's what we're doing now. Now, you might say, okay, what about other tasks, other kinds of conditions, other kinds of decisions? That would be a whole other presentation. Um, uh, in, instead, I'll just summarize what I've shown here. So perceptual decisions are well explained by this class of rise to threshold models. Uh, the most classic and most often assumed mechanism is this drift diffusion model, which accumulates sensory evidence to a constant accuracy. We and others have suggested a variation uh, the urgency gating model, where you accumulate just the novel evidence to a dropping accuracy criterion. And of course, there's other variations in the whole space of models and an ongoing, um, rather lively debate. Interestingly, though, in all of these things, all the data actually suggests that these decisions unfold in sensory motor regions. Despite the fact that they're sort of perceptual, conceptually at least, they seem to be engaging uh, a competition between actions that's biased by sensory evidence, urgency, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, of course, other types of decisions will be different regions, different models. And I'll just stop there and welcome any questions you may have. Wonderful presentation. Thank Thanks so much, Paul. We, we have a, a few minutes left for, for questions. Uh, one question stands out uh, a lot in the, in the, in the pool uh, by Chad Boulet. I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing uh, your name right. Um, can evidence be integrated across modalities instead of across time? For example, for VR visual stimulation combined with a short auditory stimulation with contextual working memory, uh, are the integration models the same? Yes. Uh, well, I think um, the temporal aspect that we were, we were discussing, is, uh, the, the aspect that I was discussing was mostly the issue of time constants and what gets you to the threshold. But what constitutes the evidence uh, information, that I think is where your question comes in. So at any moment in time, you're receiving visual information, but you're also receiving auditory information. And you may wanna filter them with different time constants uh, and combine them in different ways. For example, if an auditory signal is very brief uh, and transient and, and a visual signal uh, might be much more sluggish, that, that the informative aspect of the signal, you may actually want to use different um, low pass filters for those different modalities, then combine them all together and add the urgency signal just to, to sort of get you the reward rate part. So I think it's, it, in principle, it's possible. And, and, and context is also important. And there was a ver some very nice studies from Bill Newsom's lab where they had monkeys do these kinds of random dot discrimination tasks where on some trials, the direction of motion was important 
And in other trials, it was the color that was important. Are there more blue or yellow dots, essentially? Um, and so the monkeys were trained to use either one or the other feature. This was still within vision um, to make that decision. But you could also do it where sometimes, you know, the sound or the shape, or the, the, even the, either the sound or the visual shape matters. And then you should be able to essentially change the game in how much you're going to include one source of information versus the other, combine them together and, and bias whatever competition is going, going on. So I think there's many, many models of that. And I didn't address that. It's a great question though, boy. It definitely is. Um, I have to say, I mean, we packed too many sessions this afternoon. We, I, we should have lots more time because there's lots of, of, of great questions for you. But let's feel the second one and we're gonna unfortunately have to, to go for the other talk. Is there a difference, and if so, which one, between the collapsing boundary model and the urgency gating model? Question. They're, they're yeah. really in the same space. Um, it depends on what you think about time. There's essentially two separate independent issues. One is, does the bound collapse? And in that sense, the models, those, these two models are the same. And the other sense is the time constant of integration. In the urgency gating model, it's short. The collapsing bound, bound model, if, if, if I'm guessing correctly, you're probably referring to sort of the drift diffusion model with the collapsing bound, which says you have a collapsing bound, but you actually still have a long time constant. So in that sense, they differ. There's sort of two independent axes in that space of models. Now, certain points in that space will not match any data, like the zero time constant and zero urgency will, will give you nothing, that, that will fail. So there's sort of parts of the space that work and, and there's an ongoing debate as to which model explains uh, which task better. Uh, but th they are closely, they're all really closely related in a sense. Great question though. Well, thanks so much, Paul, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, hopefully we can follow up with the other questions, maybe on the YouTube when we post it, we'll, we'll see with the other organizers. But well, anyone uh, can always send me an email. All the emails work as well. I'm uh, slow, but I do respond. So I'm sure everybody is joining me to uh, congratulate you and uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. And we're going to move to our next uh, tutorial. Thanks, Paul. Thanks.